So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. All right. So learning objectives. We're by the end of this presentation, you should be able to um, name two chemicals that contribute to adverse health effects when they are released through the burning of fossil fuels. Be able to list three health problems with poor outdoor air quality, and be able to identify two strategies to reduce fossil fuel reliance. Right. So we're going to kind of start at the beginning. We're looking at um, energy generation by energy source in the United States. So um, for 20, for the past year, so 2017, um, over a third of our energy production came from natural gas followed up by 30% from coal, so two of the main fossil fuels. This is primarily what we're going to be discussing today when I'm talking about fossil fuel generation. I'm going to be um, referring to coal and natural gas. Um, further down the list, we have nuclear, water power, wind, solar, other renewables, and other sources are a very small piece. So over, over half of our energy production in the United States is coming from fossil fuels. So next slide. All right, so that was that. Looking at us from um, the whole country here in the state of Michigan, um, it's a little bit different, our makeup. So in 2016, 36% of our electricity was generated from the use of coal. This is actually really great because um, just two years prior to, so in 2014, more than 50% of our energy was coming from the burning of coal. Um, so while it's great that we were able to drop that from over 50% to 36%, um, natural gas was on the rise. So in 2016, 25% of the state's um, electricity generated was from natural gas, um, but it doubled between 2014 and 2016. So we decreased our amount of coal use, but we increased our amount of natural gas at the same time. All right, so this is kind of hard to read, I apologize, but you can kind of make it out. We have the state, we have the lower peninsula of Michigan here, upper peninsula. Um, you'll see some little dots, they're black and blue. Those are the outlines of where the natural gas and coal fire power plants are located within the state. So one of the things, if you can kind of make it out, you can see a lot of them are around our coastline. And then also you can kind of see the region as well, the Midwest. It's all around the Great Lakes. So a couple of key pieces about that. Um, there are no, there is no coal that's being mined in the state of Michigan. So all of that is coming from out of state. So we're relying on a fossil fuel that we are not, or a fuel for electricity that we are not producing ourselves. So that's one of the issues. Um, so the state relies heavily on coal for electricity generation, and some coal is used at the Michigan's coal plant and by other industrial, commercial, and institutional consumers. Most of the coal consumed by in the state of Michigan um, comes from west, so primarily Wyoming and Montana. You also have to think about transportation and how that coal is actually getting to the state of Michigan. Um, it's also coming from coal fields, coal fields in Pennsylvania and um, Kentucky, Western Virginia, and then Illinois. Um, another thing to keep in mind is um, for the state of Michigan when it, it comes to um, natural gas. So we have the most underground natural gas storage capacity in the nation. And the second largest number of natural gas storage fields is in Pennsylvania. So not too far away from the Great Lakes as well. And during the high demand months, natural gas is withdrawn from storage to supply Michigan and neighboring states. And Michigan is routinely ranked among the top five in residential use of natural gas and in the top 10 in total consumption. We're using a lot of natural gas to power and for power in our state. And more than three fourths of Michigan households use natural gas as their primary source for seeing their home. That's huge for the state. Um, next slide, please. All right. So I'm not going to go too far into the life cycle um, of fossil fuels. Catherine kind of highlighted a little bit about um, the life cycle of plastics and the use of natural gas and that. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that there are detrimental health implications related to the entire life cycle of both natural gas and coal. So things to highlight really quickly for the coal life cycle. So there's health effects pertaining to the mining. So when they're actually collecting it. So if you're thinking about the workers, um, the hauling and transportation of it also has other health implications. Um, preparation of it at the actual power plant, the combustion, which is where we're going to highlight a lot 
of the health implications, um, and the disposing of the post-combustion waste. So a lot of that has to do with the water um, that's used when they're cooling the plant and how that's treating all of this water that is then um, unable to use for other things. Um, same thing for natural gas. So you have to be concerned with the extraction and storage. So Catherine kind of mentioned fracking a little bit. Um, that uses a lot of water in that process. So that's something you want to consider. Um, the transportation. And I also mentioned the storage of it. So a lot of that's stored within the state of Michigan, and we're surrounded by the Great Lakes. So there's implications there. Um, and the burning, which also results in negative health implications um, due to associated emissions of toxic food. So just to keep that all in mind, we're going to be looking a lot at um, when it comes to the combustion of these fossil fuels. So next slide, please. All right, so some harmful air pollutants. Unfortunately, there are a lot of them. Um, we're not gonna go too in depth on all of them, but just a couple to highlight. So benzene is a known carcinogen. It causes cancer. There's no safe level of exposure. Um, in Catherine and in Becca's presentations, they both kind of touched upon arsenic and lead. So we know that there's health ramifications related to those. Um, and then mercury is another, which Becca touched on. Um, I want to note that mercury is only emitted from coal combustion. It's not emitted from natural gas. So just something to keep in mind. A lot of these are associated with both. However, mercury is one that is, I hate to say it's special to coal, but um, it's one that we're going to be discussing a little bit more. So we can actually go to the next slide. We're going to spend a little more time on mercury. So coal combustion is the largest source of the emissions of mercury. So it's a potent neuro neurotoxin that is especially dangerous to developing fetuses and young children. So like Becca was talking about earlier, when we're talking about vulnerable populations, pregnant women, their unborn babies, their fetus, the fetus, um, and young children are a lot of the vulnerable populations that we're talking about. Um, and so the mercury that's emitted affects local and regional populations through air and water pollution. So as you can see here, we have a coal-fired power plant which is emitting toxic pollutants into the air, which can also get into the soil and water, and then that can be ingested by the wildlife there and the fish. Um, so just one seventieth of a teaspoon of mercury deposited into a 25-acre lake can make the fish unsafe to eat. So it's a really tiny amount. I can't really picture one seventieth of a teaspoon. I don't know if anyone else can. Um, I also can't really picture a 25 acre lake, but I know that's a decent sized piece of land. Um, and the thing to keep in mind, a typical uncontrolled coal plant emits approximately 170 pounds of mercury each year. So we're talking pounds compared to less than a seventieth of a teaspoon that makes something unsafe. So that's huge. So moving on, um, one plan in particular here in the state of Michigan, which is responsible for a lot of um, mercury, is the River Rouge plant. So the River Rouge plant outside of Detroit is one of the 25 coal plants in the U.S. that emits one-third of all mercury. And it discharges 654 million gallons of wastewater per day into the Detroit River. And the implications with this which there are a multitude um, go into, it's drawn for drinking water and local residents also fish in it. And so there are usually a lot of advisories for people to know that um, fish in the Detroit River may be contaminated with toxins from the coal plant. So that includes mercury, it also includes arsenic um, and boron as well. The so next slide. So moving on from mercury, we're going to talk about another toxic pollutant that we need to be aware of, which is particulate matter 2.5, which is this one right here. It's in red. So this right here is actually human hair, just to kind of give you an idea of like how small it is. So this is generally the size of particles that are emitted when coal is burned. Um, you also have to in here it referred to as soup. Good. So it's about 1 20th the average width of a human hair, and it's particularly toxic to humans and responsible for most of the public health burden from air pollutants. And that's particularly an economic term um, due to the healthcare costs and the loss of um, school and work days. So next slide, please. Oh, 
So I'll keep talking about particulate matter while she's getting that going. So um, one of the reasons why it's so harmful to humans is because it's so small and it can get large, get lodged very deep into um, people's airways. So a lot of the other particulate matter, which is, um, oh, actually, can you go back for a second? Sorry. So PM10, which a lot of the other ones, so dust, mold, pollen, that's usually this size. It can't get as far into our airways because um, it's like trapped in like our nose and our mouth. But since particulate matter 2.5 is so small, it's able to get farther into our body. So if you can go back, thank you. And it's often loaded with toxic chemicals such as lead, mercury, arsenic, and carcinogens or cancer causing elements. Um, children, seniors, and those with pre existing con conditions are particularly susceptible to the effects. So when people inhale these pollutants, some of the particles deposit along the respiratory tract, while others penetrate deeply into the lungs where they can enter the bloodstream and travel throughout the body. So along the way, the particles irritate tissue, cause inflammation, and worsen existing breathing illnesses and damage um, circulatory system. And so the relationship between particulate matter 2.5 and certain respiratory and cardiac illnesses is linear. So as the levels of PM 2.5 increase, you're also going to see um, increased emergency room visits um, for these diseases as well. Next slide. All right, um, another two to be aware of are sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. So sulfur dioxide is emitted primarily through coal combustion um, from power plants. And when it mixes with water in the air, it forms acidic particles that can penetrate deep into the lungs. It also can cause acid rain, which can be devastating to aquatic ecosystems, get into people's drinking water. And a typical 600 megawatt coal-fired power plant without emission controls emits approximately over 14,000 tons of sulfur dioxide every year. Plus a lot that's coming up from these plants. Um, nitrogen oxide or nitrogen oxides in general, they're also emitted through the combustion from power plants and from vehicles. So in a similar manner as um, sulfur dioxide, these particles also contribute to acid rain, and they also can combine with carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds to form ground level, ground level ozone, which we will talk about next. So like I mentioned, um, so ground level ozone or smog develops in the atmosphere when nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, and volatile organic carbon or compounds mixes, well, is emitted from the combustion of fossil fuels and combines with sunlight. So when I say causes sunburn in the lungs, that's because um, breathing ozone can burn lung tissue. So it can be very uncomfortable. It can also trigger a variety of health problems, particularly for children. Again, because they are, their lungs are smaller, their bodies are smaller, they're also taking in more oxygen at a faster rate. The elderly as well, and people of all ages who have lung conditions and lung diseases such as asthma. And ground level ozone can also have harmful effects on sensitive vegetation and ecosystems. So Catherine kind of mentioned um, in her presentation talking about food and climate change and things to take into consideration when it comes to our ability to produce enough food, um, this can have effects on that as well. So next slide, please. All right. So, Air pollution and health, from what you can already gather, there are a myriad of ways that it is impacting. Um, the next couple of slides is going to focus particularly on the parts of the body that you can see in front of you right now. So next slide, please. So air pollution in the brain. That's where we're gonna start. So I already mentioned a couple neurotoxins, including mercury and lead, which target the brain and lead to serious neurological consequences. So when I'm discussing neurological consequences, I'm primarily focusing on stroke and loss of intellectual capacity. Um, a growing number of research also suggests that exposure to air pollutants, specifically PM2.5, which we discussed earlier, hardens the brain by accelerating cognitive aging and may also increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So that's something that's really starting to come up now and they're looking at the connections. Um, and moving on to respiratory health. So, already mentioned how a lot of this gets deep into our lungs, into our airways. I um, already talked about asthma a little bit. So strong scientific evidence that exposure to air pollution contributes to negative respiratory effects. Asthma is the most common chronic condition among children and the third leading cause of pediatric hospital hospitalization. 
And in 2011, an estimated 4.1 million children had an asthma attack, and 7.1 million children had asthma. That's a huge number of the population. So air pollution, including the small particles like PM2.5, nitrogen oxide, and ozone, cause increased respiratory distress and exacerbate incidences of asthma. The effects of childhood asthma do not go away as children grow up. So that's not something that they just kind of outgrow. Instead, studies have shown that children who have asthma exhibit substantial long-lasting health impacts, including lower general health status and missed school and work days as young adults. Next slide. Moving on to the cardiovascular system and air pollution's effects there. So it's, air pollution is associated with increased risk of heart attacks, stroke, arrhythmia, and heart failure. And recent research also indicates that long-term exposure to particulates plays a role in the development of atherosclerosis and underlies the causes of many cardiovascular diseases. Um, other more recent research has found that nearly one in five deaths due to cardiovascular disease in the U.S. is associated with PM2.5 exposure. Um, in, oh, sorry, that's okay. So in 2016, a study from the American Cancer Society's Cancer Prevention Study found that adults were at five times higher risk for, for mortality caused by cardiovascular disease due to the exposure of PM2.5 released during coal combustion. So that's just from coal-fired power plants, not even all of our fossil fuel use. And um, ozone may also play a role in the development of cardiovascular disease. Several studies conducted have found increased risk of hospital admission or emergency department visit for cardiovascular disease due to ozone exposure, um, as well as heart rate variability. Okay, now next slide. So, looking at the global scale, so the World Health Organization has found that um, approximately 3 million deaths each year are linked to outdoor air pollution. When you open that up to include indoor air pollution, um, 6.5 million premature deaths each year. So that kind of equals out to one in nine total global deaths from exposure to indoor and outdoor air pollution, which is a huge amount of people. Um, in 2016, the World Health Organization um, determined that 92% of the world population was living in places where the air quality guideline levels were not met. So who is most at risk? We've kind of touched on this a little bit um, when we're talking about vulnerable populations. So pregnant women, children, individual, individuals with cardiovascular respiratory issues already, diabetics, individuals with existing health conditions, and frontline communities. Um, one of the big reasons why frontline communities make the list is because they are within um, the closest surrounding areas to a lot of these plants. So it is impacting everyone. However, we have to keep in mind the fact that it is impacting people at different rates. Okay, so in Michigan, bringing it down from the global level to something a little bit more local, um, recent research estimates that exposure to PM2.5 and ozone causes 275 people to die and 640 people to experience serious illness in Michigan every year. Um, this makes Michigan the seventh worst state in the country for air pollution-related morbidity and mortality. Um, we also rank fifth in the nation in premature deaths, hospital admissions, and heart attacks attributed to coal-fired power plant pollution, and that costs um, in Michigan and Michigan residents $15 billion each year. So this is a little bit more. This information right here is specifically related to the oldest coal-fired power plants within the state. So as you can see, we're looking at premature mortality, hospital emissions related to respiratory and cardiovascular incidents, chronic bronchitis, um, emergency room visits pertaining to asthma and asthma exacerbations, and minor restricted activity days. So this isn't even like the whole scope of things. This is just when you're looking at the dirtiest of our coal power plants within the state. Um, oh no, you're fine. We're moving on anyways. So another thing that you have to keep in mind um, is the effect fossil fuels have on our changing climate. So Catherine mentioned a little bit about climate change already. I'm not going to go too far into it either because that's why we have our climate change 201 webinar next month. Um, we'll hear from some experts on it. But just to keep in mind, fossil fuel combustion is the leading contributor to climate change. And about a third of the greenhouse gases that increase, increase, 
about a third of our um, sorry, about a third of our greenhouse gases are coming from coal combustion. And natural gas, whose primary ingredient is methane, which is off, is usually um, provided as an alternative to coal, since when it burns, it almost it only emits half of the carbon dioxide. Um, is actually not a good alternative. Um, and due to, that is because, so leaking methane, which escapes across the natural gas supply from when it's um, actually fracted to when it's being held to when it's actually being burned, um, has a greater climate impact. And it's actually probably a lot greater. That's because while it is in the atmosphere, methane has a much stronger heat retaining impact than carbon dioxide. So over a 20 year time frame, methane is 86 times more potent at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. Okay, so, so here are um, carbon dioxide emissions by source in the United States. As you can see, electricity has a huge chunk of that pie with 37%. Um, this data is a little, it's a little bit old. I think this is from 2015 or 2016. Yeah, transportation is down 33%. Yeah, because transportation is taken a little bit off of electricity. So, um, next slide. So, a little bit about what climate change is. So warming temperatures due to the burning of fossil fuels increases the blanket of greenhouse gases that keep our surface temperatures warm. And so because they're continuing to be burned um, to increase the greenhouse gas amount, we have to look at a lot of these things that it's resulted in. So increase in extreme weather events, rising sea levels, loss of biodiversity, um, just to name a few. More of the month. There you go. Yeah. So some of the some of the impacts that people have to worry about. So I mentioned extreme heat. Um, the odds of experiencing an intensely hot summer have risen from one in 100 to one in 10 since 1980. Um, declining air quality, so more dust and particulate pollution in the air when there's droughts. So Catherine mentioned droughts. Um, the other side of that, you have to worry about flooding and more severe precipitation, um, along with extreme and changing weather patterns and superstorms. Um, Insect-borne diseases expanded habitat for carrying disease-carrying insects, like mosquitoes, because they like heat and water. Dengue fever, malaria, and Lyme disease are others that you have to be aware of. And you also have to think about, um, I know someone mentioned this earlier about looking at psychological damage, but if you're someone who has to experience a severe weather event, you have to think about the anxiety the depression, the post-traumatic stress disorder, that can be um, implicated in that as well. All right, so in the state of Michigan, we have seen some as well. So here, this is one of my favorite maps. I don't know why, I just, I just really like showing this. So it's showing the changing in winters and summers in the state. So this is where we're at right now. Um, this is where we're supposed to be in 2030, but by 2095, this is what our winters will be like. So that puts us in a warmer area than we are now. And then if you look at it by other summers, by 2030, we're gonna be a little more in this area, but then in 2095, we're gonna be down here. So if you think about it, Michigan has some of the most diverse agriculture in the US. That would have implications for that. We also have people who are not used to having extreme heat. I know the past couple places I live have not had air conditioning. And I know there's a lot of other people who have that as well. So these are things we really need to be taking into consideration. Not to mention the fact that we have a lot of people with pre-existing conditions. So if you have cardiovascular issues, if you have respiratory problems, extreme heat can be very detrimental to you. Um, so there, oh, sorry. Um, sudden large amounts of rain is something that we've been experiencing a lot of um, just most recently in the Lansing area. Um, which also has a lot of different detrimental impacts. So if you think about if after a flood and your home isn't properly taken care of, you can have a lot of things to talk about there. So the mold, the mildew, things of that nature. So instead of going on with a lot more of the awful things that are happening, I'm going to turn over to Alexis to talk about some of the solutions. Thank you. Are you going to talk about any solutions? No. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, usually I'm actually pretty you know, depressing as loud, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we've actually had a good day in energy policy today, which I'll get to in the, in the next slide. Um, so this is the energy policy today. Actually, one thing um, also related to climate change. Anybody 
that you run into questions about some of the you know serious real damage that it can do here in Michigan, point them to the pothole. The changes in temperature, the freezes, the thaw, the fre why we have roads that look like this, along with a whole bunch of other issues which we're not covering <laughs> <laughs> this um, course, but yeah. Um, Anyway, so a couple of the solutions that are out there. Um, first is energy efficiency. So um, all of those things that you hear about, you know, people doing in buildings and their homes, putting in insulation, um, you know, changing to you know their light bulbs, um, you know, getting an energy efficient furnace, all of those things reduce the amount of energy that actually needs to be generated. So um, if you reduce the amount of energy that needs to be generated, that means you're using less coal, less natural gas. Cheapest energy out there is energy that we're not using. So not only you know, can it make your house more comfortable, um, it can save you money. Um, more efficient homes and buildings. Let's just give you a couple of examples. In the hospital, um, a lot of the hospitals have been doing stuff um, to put in lighting systems, again, insulation. And they've also put in some renewables, which will be another solution which we'll get to. Um, but for every dollar invested in energy efficiency, um, customers avoid four dollars and thirty-five cents of energy cost. So there's a real big return on it. Um, how we ended up with a good energy day? Um, amazingly enough, it wasn't even in Michigan. It was federal, and I don't expect anything good out of federal these days. <laughs> but it happened. And what happened today was there was a spending bill that went through and was passed and signed. And in the administration's proposed budget and spending bill. There were horrendously deep cuts to the Energy Star program, to the Weatherization Assistance, which is the program that does like some of these different um, insulation, lighting, heating for low-income families. Um, the LIHEAP, which is the um, Low Income Energy Assistance, so the stuff that helps people pay their bill, uh, while it contributes to some of the weatherization programs. All of that was proposed to be just slashed to half. And um, amazingly enough, Congress ignored the president's budget on this. And in fact, there were some increases today in the spending bill in some of these programs. So um, one of the things that we work on at the Ecology Center is a um, program called um, Michigan Energy Efficiency for All, or MIFA. And you'll hear more about this as we go on. Um, a little bit about it for Lansing Day, so there's a couple of policies that we're looking at, and then I think we get to the environmental justice um, presentation as well. We'll talk a little bit about the MIFA work. But the MIFA coalition works also um, nationally with something called EFA, which so is drop the M. And <laughs> you're gonna hear lots of nice you know, acronyms, but uh, <laughs> we'll get your sheet. Um, <laughs> you were looking like, oh my God. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, the EFA coalition has been working for months now um, trying to make sure that these programs stay in place, so we're actually having a pretty happy day. Mm -hmm. All right, so energy, back to energy efficiency. So, <laughs> um, you know, improves the quality of home, um, insulation, um, warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer. Um, there's a lot of programs that target low-income housing. Uh, those homes, because they tend to be you know, older housing stock um, and don't, you know, these things actually take some investment. Insulating a whole new house or a whole house, especially when it was built in like 1910, is not something that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. And so these types of programs actually help with some of the weatherization and you know make it easier for people to breathe in their home, help you know seal out the bugs, uh, so it can actually really lead to a healthier house to live in. Um, communities, obviously, I said it reduces emissions because you don't have to burn as much, uh, protecting the Great Lakes. And also, you know, um, for economics, there's a really high energy burden if you are low income. Uh, most people, sort of average income, will spend about you know, five to ten, five to eight percent of their income on um, energy costs. Whereas if you are low income, you end up with it about, about fifteen to twenty percent. And so if you have to spend money to keep the utilities on, but obviously that's money you're not spending on food, on transportation, on going to the doctor, and mm -hmm. all those things. So I actually have pretty significant impact just by doing energy efficiency. Next one. Renewable energy. So we can't solve everything through energy efficiency. There's a lot more we can do and we haven't even 
you know, come close to hitting what's possible. But we also have to replace um, the energy that we're <laughs> and you know, as populations increase, demand for energy increases. So you know, we have to figure out a way to generate energy without burning the fossil fuels. So um, what we you know fight for is replacing coal-fired power plants and natural gas with alternatives like wind and solar geothermal. Um, Michigan Public Service Commission, which regulates the utilities, although some would argue they don't do a great job of doing that. Um, we will get to that a little bit later is one of the things that's going on right now. Um, have already said that renewable energy is cheaper than building a new coal plant. So there are no new coal plants coming online. So the fight, you know, and slowly the coal plants are shutting down. But the fight is now what's going to replace them. And, you know, the utilities right now are pushing a lot for natural gas, in large part because right now it's cheap. Um, the cost of renewable continues to go down. And so now if we actually got to 25% of our energy from renewable sources, we could reduce health damages by $1 billion per year. Um, one of the, the things that's also happening this year, there's a lot going on in energy. Um, and we're not talking about it a lot until it actually happens. But there's a proposal out there to, um, to put something on the ballot that will require 30% renewable by 2030. Mm -hmm. um, it's collecting signatures now. Um, we're not going to get really involved in it until it actually ends up on the ballot, but just nobody's out there. Um, but we're sort of moving that direction anyway. So, you know, the big goal right now is to make sure that while the, co the cost of renewables continues to decrease, that we put investments into more renewables and more energy efficiency and don't build as much right now so that we can avoid using, building a whole bunch of natural gas that we're locked into in for the years. Um, federal. Okay. So <laughs> this is when I go back to the like when I want and there's nothing happening happening. Um, <laughs> um, you know, federal mercury and air toxic standards have been introduced. They're sitting out there. They could do a lot to prevent premature deaths, heart attacks. Um, the Trump administration has been, you know, really inactive on these things <laughs> um, and is not moving anything forward. We'll go to the next one. Clean power plan, which we were super excited about for a while, um, was introduced under the Obama administration. Um, it was the first ever, ever federal limit on carbon emissions from power plants. Um, it was released on, um, in August of 2015. It's you know, made just each state um, plan reduction targets, and Michigan, um, you know, had started doing some plans. The governor actually had, you know, created a task force within the Department of Environmental Quality and the Department of Energy. Now, at the same time, our um, attorney general decided to join a whole bunch of other attorney generals to file suit to try and stop it. Um, again, you know, the implementation of the Clean Seed Power Plan can have a lot, huge impact on health with death, respiratory problems, um, missed work. Yeah. So, um, so Shudi had filed the lawsuit. Um, what happened with the Clean Power Plan, of course, is you know all of these attorney generals had filed a lawsuit to stop implementation, and so the Supreme Court put a stay on the implementation pending judicial review. So the case was pending. And of course, it was you know introduced by the Obama administration, so they were going to fight to have it all implemented. Well, the election happened. So, um, March of 2016, Michigan suspended its planning just until further notice, until something happened. So we were hopeful that it would move through the court, but of course, when the Trump administration came in, it had stated really clearly that it wants you know nothing to do with the Clean Power Plan. Is going to reintroduce it. Um, new clean power plants, clean, um, although they've talked about it in terms of clean coal, uh, which there is no such thing. Um, and so the clean power plan is just sitting out there with nothing happening at this point. It's still pending in the courts, but now you have an administration that won't defend it. So it's still out there. We're not active on it right now, but there's not a lot we can do. But um, there are occasionally, you'll see something come through from a group or two that. Um, it's still saying, you know, defend it. 
and you know when there are actions to be taken, we do get involved. There's people. Hi. <laughs> so, um, so state energy policies. So while the federal has been sort of a you know drag for about a year and a half now, um, there's been actually a lot going on at the state level, and so. I'm going to go back just a little bit, not in the slide, I'm sorry. Um, in 2008, there was the first like, big energy legislation passed in Michigan, and it included um, renewable energy standards and energy efficiency standards. And what they did is said that we have to get to 10% renewable by 2015. And it was 1% per year in energy efficiency. Well, then in 2012, um, there was a ballot initiative trying to actually increase the renewable energy standard that was done as a constitutional amendment. That failed miserably, um, along with every other constitutional amendment that was tried in 2012. It was just a bad year for proposals. The proposal that's coming up this year is not a constitutional amendment, it's a legislative change, so it's a little bit different. But there was a lot of pressure because 2015 was coming and the legislation essentially was going to sunset it. And so we were fighting for several years in our that led to with us quite a bit. Um, and what happened was the renewable energy standard essentially ended at 2015. It stayed at 10% and then it stopped. And the energy efficiency, the way it was written, sort of went on indefinitely, and that was the ruling of the Public Service Commission. But we continued to fight, and then in 2016, actually during the lame duck session, so on the last night, of the legislative session, like December 18th at three o'clock in the morning, um, <laughs> the legislature actually passed Public Act 341 and 342, which increased um, the renewable energy standard to 15% by 2021, um, kept the energy efficiency standard at 1% per year, but provided incentives to utilities that actually achieve savings beyond 1.5%. So there's this real incentives for utilities to go beyond. Um, also required regulated utilities to file something called an integrated resource plan. And now we're going to get into too much wonky stuff that's going to know who's going to be crazy, and so I'm not going to do too much of that. But anyway, the integrated resource plan can go next. Um, so what the integrated resource planning means is that the big regulated utilities, or all the regulated utilities, um, but the big ones we concentrate on are like the DTE and consumers energy. Um, have to file um, a plan basically like how they're going to meet generation and distribution and everything needs um, starting in 2019 and beginning and then every five years after that. Um, the last year, um, the Michigan Public Service Commission has been holding these work group sessions which we've been involved in. Um, about all of these different topics, modeling and forecasting and all this stuff that I can't even begin to understand. We have lots of really smart people who are very, you know, who are engineers and get all of it. Um, you know, my work has been you know, primarily on the energy waste reduction, energy efficiency, and some of the low income work. And there are people who are a lot smarter than I am working on modeling. Um, so, but essentially these work plans have been go work groups have been going on all year. And now the Public Service Commission has released basically what the rules are for the integrated resource plan that the utilities need to submit. So we go to the next. Is that it? Oh, oh yeah. It might be. Okay. <laughs> so um, the first re um, integrated resource plan is actually going to be submitted by consumers um, probably late this year. Um, they've already started having a couple. Um, public info sessions, um, trying to say that consumers tend to be a little bit better at their public engagement than DCE is. Um, also tend to be a little bit more friendly about sort of working with us. Although DCE on some of the energy efficiency stuff has actually gotten a lot better in the last year. Some of it was because um, some of our partners do them and the part of the settlement, but they've gotten better. <laughs> um, so the other thing that's going on right now, and that's why I brought the natural, the natural gas and about the generation, um, and this is coming to a close pretty soon, but there still may be some opportunity to engage in the next couple of weeks. And I know we have a petition 
that Mara, I'm sure, will send on to you to get you to sign on if you're willing. But um, right now, there's something called a certificate of necessity case that's pending at the Public Service Commission. And what it is is DTE trying to get in under the wire before these new rules all go into effect. It has put in a request to build an 1,100 megawatt um, natural gas, $1 billion natural gas plant in the thumb. And um, what they are saying is they need to do this to meet all of the needs of generation, reliability. And so we, along with about 15 of our partners, I think, um, have intervened in the case. And so what that means is we have a bunch of lawyers who file as interveners and then provide testimony. And what we're trying to argue is you don't need to build a $1 billion plant. Um, it's not good for consumers. Because, um, of course, this cost all gets passed on to you if you live in DTE's um, territory. Um, but that you can actually, you know, more cheaply um, invest more. In, you'll have to build some natural gas. We acknowledge that. They're not, we're not going to get away with nothing. But you can make it a much smaller by investing in more renewable energy and more energy efficiency. And so the petition that's out there is saying, you know, just that. Um, and why I made the snide comments about the Public Service Commission earlier and their ability to um, regulate is in this case. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> hey. <laughs> in this case, um, the staff of the Public Service Commission has already essentially said, you know, your arguments are right. They could actually do this a little bit cheaper, but they should be able to build their plant anyway. So um, we're referring to it now as the um, $1 billion mulligan, if any of you know the golf <laughs> um, And essentially, so, you know, this is still ongoing, and it's a way that, you know, if you want to get involved in a little bit just right away and jump right in, um, there's a petition, there's some letters to the editor that we're getting out, and we definitely want some health voices in those. And Barbara doesn't know about this yet because she hasn't checked her email. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's been busy all day. But apparently, um, one of our partners in this whole thing had a little bit of money for some advertising. So if you want to be in a commercial, <laughs> talk to me at the reception. Because they're going to be filming that. Anyway, um, that's what I got. So, questions. You have to come up with questions. <laughs> yes. I'm a little curious. Um, it sounds like maybe this isn't happening, but my sense was kind of that, um, like DT and big car producing folks have kind of read the writing on the wall and seen the direction that like society is going and kind of adjusting accordingly. Or do you think they're kind of paying on to? Yeah. Here, here's the thing. Um, DT especially has you know a vested interest in some yeah. of the fossil fuels. Yeah. So um, they, they have all said that they are moving more and more towards renewables, but they're trying to push it off as long as possible. Right. They're trying to essentially you know build what the law requires. Um, but, you know, the later the date, the better. Right. Um, right. And one of the other arguments against like, the natural gas is right now it's really cheap, but we don't know that it's going to stay that way. Mm -hmm. And the price is pretty volatile. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, you build a wind farm, pretty much the cost stays what it is. Right. Yeah. Um, the cost of wind never goes up. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, and consumers actually sort of Amusingly enough, the day after the ballot proposal was announced, consumers um, put out their press release and their announcement that they're going to hit 40% by what was it, 2050. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, you know, they are recognizing that they have to move this direction, but they're certainly trying to keep it slow. Huh. Okay. So, um, you know, part of the recognition was they actually are moving away from the coal plant. And they know it's, you know, done and out. Right. I would say that's the big thing is a lot of people are recognizing the fact that, like, coal is over. It's just uh, reiterating the fact that, you know, we can't just be going straight to natural gas. So even when we were meeting with, was it, I was meeting with some folks who were working in air quality, and they were like, oh, yeah, no, we know coal is over, but we're going to switch to natural gas. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we just need to keep reminding them, like, okay, we can do some of that, but there are better alternatives that we should be really about. Natural gas absolutely is cleaner than coal. But burning natural gas is cleaner than coal. There's some debate about you know, the whole process. I mean, mm -hmm. But you know, burning it is gas cleaner than coal, but that doesn't make it clean. So, other questions? Yes. I just have a comment. I think um, that quote, the cost of the land will never go up to be really good to the commercial. Does that mean that you're volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> if I can borrow your quote. Absolutely. <laughs> See, Charles would think I'd get anybody. <laughs> Charles is our kind of energy for a man to act I don't know if it will be able to get there anybody. Okay. So you guys mentioned the Rouge Planet, the Rouge Planet. Are you guys, do you guys have any like programs or things or connections that you do out there? In that particular area, we've worked, with, um, we've worked a lot with Sierra Club who does with their Beyond Coal camp, campaign. Um, we had actually some of our health fellows testify at the EPA hearings around um, SO2 emissions. Um, you know, that's one of the ones that's actually not scheduled, that's a later schedule to mm -hmm. close, and they tend to be out of compliance fairly often. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, so we, we um, we do a lot of work with um, Sierra Club on that because they're sort of, you know, they're very focused on individual coal plants, and so we come in and help where we can be useful, usually with you know health professionals like you. <laughs> I grew up out there, that's why I like that. Yeah, and, and Trenton Channel is the other one. So. Other questions? Yeah. 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 One of the things that comes up in the facility today is sort of the institutional side. And are there um, other things to talk about there in terms of solutions? And what they yeah, and I mean, the Healthy Hospitals Initiative, you know, there is an energy component to it, too. And um, a lot of the hospitals have started initiating that. Um, we used to do our facilities at Beaumont, and they've done a lot of combined heat and gas. Um, they did some solar on the parking structure. They replaced all of their light bulbs. They've done a decent amount. A lot of the hospitals invested in some of the energy efficiency stuff. I think more and more we're seeing some solar panels being put on. So yeah, there are institutional things as well. Thank you. Thank you. For our webinar attendees, that concludes our presentation today. Can we send you a link for the rest of the week? Yeah, it's a violation. Well, yeah. We'll be following up. We'll be following up the email with links to the presentation, the PDF. And the evaluation. Well, thank you for joining us today. So, for the in person attendees. <laughs>